let's everybody get our Bibles and uh, let's turn to uh, a verse in the Bible that summarizes the whole Bible. Now, if there's one verse in the Bible that summarizes the whole verse, that's the verse that we want to uh, turn to. And it's 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. So it's 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse uh, 15. So uh, let's everybody get our Bibles. Let's read it together. Now, this verse summarizes the entire Bible. And here uh, we have the entire Word of God and the message of the Word of God summarized in one verse in the Bible. So let's everybody get our Bibles and let's read it together. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all attestation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Amen. Let's read it through one more time. This uh, one verse in the Bible that summarizes the whole Bible. It summarizes all the 66 books of the Bible. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. So let's everybody read it once again. Together, this is... Amen. You may be seated. And uh, this morning, what we want to uh, look at is a simple verse in the Bible. Now, again, if there's one verse in the Bible that summarizes the whole Bible. Now, now everybody here this morning is going to learn how to summarize the whole Bible, the entire Bible from Genesis to uh, Revelation. See, what, uh, how we summarize the whole Bible. In other words, there are 66 different books in the Bible. But see, here's a verse in the Bible that summarizes the entire Bible and tells us what the entire Bible is all uh, about. See, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul said, of whom I am chief. And he always looked upon himself um, as someone who was uh, certainly a sinner saved by grace. And then for those young fellows back there in the back row, we will mention uh, along the line about Mickey Mantle and how Mickey Mantle came to know the Lord as his uh, personal uh, uh, Savior. But now uh, this verse tells us why Jesus Christ came into the world. Now, see, what's the Bible all about? The Bible is about the Messiah, the Savior. His name is Jesus Christ and why he came into uh, the world. Now, the Bible is very clear here that Jesus Christ came into the world to save, the Bible says here, sinners. Now, that word sinners is used over and over again in the Bible and in the Word of God. Now, see, that is why... Jesus Christ came into the world. That summarizes the entire Bible. That's what the entire Bible is all about. See, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now, he did not come into the world to save good people, but uh, he came into the world to save sinners. And even the Apostle Paul said, I am the chief of uh, a sinner. So now, Number one, as we think of the Word of God, see, this verse tells us why we all need to be saved. See, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. See, Christ Jesus came into the world. Now, He did not come into the world to feed the poor. We don't read about that in the Word of God, that uh, anybody teaches that is not teaching the Word of God. See, He didn't uh, come into the world to bring peace into the world. In fact, Jesus said, I came the very opposite to bring division, even in homes, those who know the Lord and uh, uh, those uh, who do not. Now, see, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is very, very clear that, they, that he came into the world to save sinners. Now, and the reason for that is that, see, all of us are sinners in need of salvation. See, everybody, the Bible says, is a sinner and everybody needs salvation. 
and Jesus Christ came into the world to save uh, sinners. Now, the Bible teaches that, number one, say every one of us are born sinners. The Bible is very, very clear in relation to that. Psalm 58 and verse 3, and we all know that no one ever has to teach a child to do wrong. See, we all naturally do wrong. See, why? The Bible says that we are born sinners. See, every person is born a sinner and is in need of Bible uh, salvation. And then the Bible teaches that we are also sinners by choice. See, every one of us have made decisions and choices to do wrong and to sin against God. See, all of us have uh, made deliberate choices to sin. So uh, certainly we are all uh, uh, sinners. And then the Bible is very, very clear that we are all sinners by our conduct. See, the Bible says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, say, we are all sinners by our conduct. See, no one um, in their right mind could ever say, I have never sinned. Say, no one could ever say, I am not a, a sinner. Why? The Bible says we're sinners by birth and by choice and by uh, conduct. And then the Bible teaches that we are sinners that are separated from God. See, uh, we uh, are dead in our sins. We are separated from God. See, and, um, and that's why we need to be saved to be brought into a right relationship with uh, uh, the Lord. And then uh, uh, the Bible teaches that, see, we are sinners under the judgment of God. Now, uh, that's something we don't hear uh, much about today, but the Bible is very, very clear. See, we are not only sinners, but the Bible says we are sinners under the uh, the judgment of God. John 3.36, that great chapter where we have John 3.16. John 3.36 tells us very, very clearly that uh, those who are not saved are under the wrath of God, that the wrath of God abideth on them. John 3, uh, 36. Now, see, this verse in the Bible summarizes the whole Bible. See, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is why he came. See, to save uh, sinners. Why? See, all of us are sinners in the sight of of God. The Bible teaches there's no one that uh, is righteous in the sight of God who has not uh, sinned. Now, another uh, thing the Bible teaches very, very uh, clearly, see, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, that's a great Bible word, saved, save. Over and over again, that verse is, uh, that word is used in uh, the Bible, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, say, what are we saved from according to the Bible? Say, what is a person saved from? And the Bible is very, very clear. Say, we are saved from the wrath of God. We are saved from the judgment of God. We are saved from eternal hell. The Bible teaches that's the price of our sin is that we'll be punished in hell everlastingly and eternally. And the reason uh, for, uh, why is because, you see, uh, God is a holy God. God cannot look upon sin. God cannot countenance sin. God cannot allow any sinner to go uh, to heaven. See, our sin separates us from God. Now, you see, uh, what are we saved from? And the Bible is very clear. See, the wrath of God. Now, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, the Bible says, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath 
to come. See, uh, the Bible teaches about the wrath of God, the judgment of God to come. See, we are all sinners. We're separated from God. And uh, we need to be saved from the judgment of God upon sin because God is a holy God and God cannot look upon uh, a sin. Now, you see, the verse says, uh, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Say, in other words, say, Jesus does the saving. Jesus came to save sinners. Now, now how can Jesus Christ save a sinner? How does he save uh, a, a sinner? Now, the Bible is very, very clear. Say, we cannot save ourselves. Say, there's nothing that I can do to save myself. Say, there's nothing that, uh, no good works that I can do. No good deed that I uh, can uh, do. Say, no one is saved by being good or doing good deeds. The Bible is crystal clear on that. Say, again, say, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Say, he's the one that uh, can save a person. Now, now, um, why we need to be saved? Because we're all sinners. There's no question uh, about that. But now, see, uh, the way we're saved is by what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. See, there's only one way to be saved, and that is through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And the Bible is very, very clear that even before he went to the cross, he said that he would shed his blood, say Matthew 26, 28, for the remission of sins. In other words, say it's only on the basis of his blood, what he did for us on the cross, can uh, uh, we be saved. Now, say the Bible teaches in this verse, Christ Jesus came into the world to save Sinners. Now, someone might say, well, I thought Christ came to save good people. Say, um, I thought uh, uh, Christ Jesus came into the world to save Roman Catholics or Baptists or uh, Jewish people uh, and so forth. No, see, the Bible is very clear. There's only one class of people that Jesus Christ can save. There's only one person that can get, type of person that can get saved, and that is a sinner. See, the Bible says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So the Bible is very clear in relation uh, to that. Now, see, the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, see, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Who did he die for? He died for sinners. And that's the way God's love was manifested and revealed in Jesus Christ. It says um, that he died for sinners. He died for us. See, and that's what the Bible is all about. That Christ Jesus came into the world, see, to save sinners. First Corinthians uh, 15 and verse 3. The Bible says very clearly, Christ died for our uh, sins. Now, see, and that is why Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. That's why he had to go to the cross. You see, and it was only on the cross that the payment was made for sin. And the only way that anybody can be saved is through the blood of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. See, that's a central message of all of the Word of God. Now, the verse says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, and the way he did that is that he died on the cross to take our judgment our hell. He was our substitute. He died in my place. As the Bible says, Christ died for our sins. Christ died for me. Christ died to forgive me of my uh, sins. Now, 
The thing that we need to always uh, get a hold of is Calvary. See, uh, the cross. And see, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And it was through his work on the cross that sinners can be saved. Now, uh, as we think of the cross, remember before they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, he was beaten severely. He was beaten very, very severely before he was crucified. They scourged him, they mocked him, they spit upon him, uh, and they completely humiliated the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have a little note here from a uh, emergency room doctor who happens to be a Christian, and as he studies the Bible, uh, he brings out this about uh, how Jesus Christ must have looked before he was crucified. Now, and uh, the doctor says, we know that Jesus was beaten in the face and head as he was uh, mocked before he went to the cross. Uh, and I can assure you with all confidence, this is the doctor making the comment, that by the time the Lord was crucified, after his beatings, remember he was scourged, and that's a beating where he was beat over and over again, and many times uh, the victim would die as a result of the scourging, and the reason for that is because a vital organ sometimes would be exposed, and, and the person would die right there uh, and then. But... Um, he says it's almost certain uh, that um, uh, that both his eyes were swollen and shut, and no doubt his nose was pouring out blood. Now, a lot of times we see pictures of Calvary. I've never seen a picture of Calvary that is true to the Word of God. Now, this uh, uh, doctor uh, says that in all probability his eyes were swollen shut. See. And um, his nose was pouring out blood. And he says, I can tell you that when people are struck in the mouth with a fist, the first thing that happens is that the lower teeth come right through the lip. And uh, he said, I've taken care of many people in the emergency room who've come in in beaten up uh, fights with their teeth sticking through their lips, both in the upper and lower sides. If Jesus was tied and held and beaten in the face by these strong uh, soldiers, I don't think there's any doubt that his lips were torn and left hanging. Did you ever think of that? Say, as we think of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, his eyes are swollen shut. His nose is bleeding. Now, in all probability, his teeth per, uh, uh, protruded to, through uh, his lips. That's not a very pretty picture, but that's what the Bible teaches about uh, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the doctor goes on and says, and some of his teeth were knocked, uh, probably knocked loose or maybe even knocked out. Now, you see, that's what happened to Jesus Christ before he went to Calvary. He was beaten, he was spit upon, um, he, he uh, received the scourging, and over and over again as we uh, read the Word of God. Now, you see, and then after all of that, now, that's why there is no movie, no picture, no artist that uh, I have known that any picture that I've ever seen that depicts the, uh, the, the agony that Jesus Christ went through even before he was crucified on the cross. And then the Bible is very, very clear. After all of that, after the beating and the mockery and the scourging and uh, uh, so forth, then the Bible says they actually took a hammer and they took a, a large spike-type nail and they, they would lay the victim on the cross and actually nail him to the cross. That's agony. That's what they did. Why was Jesus hanging on the cross? Because, see, these brutal soldiers took a hammer and a spike-like nail, and they actually nailed him 
to the cross. That's what it means to be crucified. See, and then they lifted up uh, uh, the cross. See, uh, after they nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. Now, it's not a pretty picture, but you see, the Bible says that's how we were saved because of what Jesus Christ did for us, took our place, our punishment upon him on the cross of Calvary. And the Bible uh, is very, very clear. And then they would take the cross, they lift up the cross, and they'd put it in actually uh, a socket type thing. And then if they really want it to be cruel to this victim whose eyes were swollen shut, whose uh, nose was bleeding with blood, uh, teeth probably protruding, protruding through his, uh, his lips and so forth, then if they really want to be mean, they would lift up the cross and then let it fall in the socket. See, uh, to promote maximum agony for the victim. And so, uh, say, why can we be saved? Because Jesus Christ died for our sins. Because Jesus Christ went to the cross, say, and paid the price so that we might be forgiven of our sins. That's why the Bible says, see, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. See, it's his blood. It's what he did for us on the cross of uh, Calvary. So, see, that's why 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15 is, uh, I believe, the verse that summarizes the whole Bible. Say, mark it in your Bible, 1 Timothy 1.15. Say, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Say, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the only way he saved sinners is by his death and the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary. So that's why we can be saved. See, because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. See, he died for you. He died for me. That is why he was crucified. See, and this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that means you. That means me. See, he came to save you from the penalty of your sin, eternal hell. He came to save me from my sin and uh, the penalty of my sin, which is eternal hell. That's what the Bible is all about. Don't let anybody tell you the Bible is about feeding the poor. That's not what the Bible teaches. See, uh, now obviously we want to help anybody we can. And if anybody is in need, we uh, go out of our way to help them. No question about that. But see... The Bible, the main message of the Bible, the thing what the Bible is all about, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the only person he can save is a a sinner. Now, the question we need to ask is, are you saved? Someone might say, well, pastor, I hope I'm saved. That's not good enough. That's not Bible salvation. Do you know You're saved. Well, you might say, maybe I'm saved and uh, I hope I'm saved. No, see, the Bible teaches we can know that we're saved. And if we don't know it, that means we're not saved. And that means we need to be saved. So uh, the question is, are you saved? Now, we said that we would uh, make mention of how Mickey Mantle got saved. Now, now Mickey Mantle was the star of the New York Yankees in her glory days in the 50s um, and in the, uh, the 60s. He was uh, the most well-known ball player of his, uh, uh, of his time. Now, he had uh, uh, 536 home runs. He had 1,509 RBIs. Um, he had, he played in seven world championships. Imagine that world series, seven world, um, championships. He was the most valuable player three 
times in three different seasons where he's the most uh, valuable player. So he was the star on uh, the New York uh, Yankees, and right after that, he was elected to the Hall of uh, Fame. But now, um, say, on the team was a second baseman by the name of Bobby Richardson. Now, Bobby Richardson came from a good, sound Baptist church, and uh, he was saved. He loved the Lord. By the way, an interesting thing, all these guys, say Yogi Berra, Phil Rizzuto, Mickey Mantle, uh, all these guys, they lived here in New Jersey. They lived up in North Jersey, and they go across the George Washington Bridge to uh, go to the Yankee Stadium. But they're all Jersey guys, so to speak. They all lived in uh, in New Jersey. But um, as we uh, think of Bobby Richardson, he was a committed Christian. He was a witnessing Christian. And uh, he uh, was known, they all made fun of Bobby Richardson, and they said, oh, uh, you're the preacher. You're the preacher on the New York Yankees. He wasn't a preacher. He's a ball player. And, um, but, uh, very interesting. And they, they'd always make fun of Bobby Richardson. And Mickey Mantle would make fun of Bobby Richardson. And he'd say, Bobby, you drink milk. We drink whiskey. You drink milk. We drink whiskey. And he witnessed to him many, many times and, um, told him, uh, Mickey, you need to be saved. You need to come to uh, know Christ as your Savior. And and uh, over and over again, he witnessed to him. By the way, uh, Roger Maris was the first person to break Babe Ruth's record of 60 home runs in a year. He played on the Yankees also. And it's very interesting because nine years before Mickey Mantle died, Bobby Richardson preached the funeral of Roger Maris. Evidently, Roger Maris was also a Christian, um, and he asked Bobby Richardson to preach his funeral, and he did. Mickey Mantle attended that funeral, and uh, that's when he said to Bobby Richardson, uh, and Mickey Mantle was not saved at that time, but he said, Bobby, I want you to preach my funeral. When I die, I want you to preach my funeral. Well, anyway, you see, uh, Mickey Mantle had a rough time, because Mickey Mantle was an alcoholic. All five of his sons became alcoholics and problem drinkers. See, and uh, by the way, see, uh, before he died, about a year before Mickey Mantle died, he checked him in, uh, himself in to the, uh, uh, the, uh, sit- uh, the Betty Ford Clinic. Now, the Betty Ford Clinic was for alcoholics. And, uh, he checked himself in because he was an alcoholic. That's, and he admitted to that. And he said that was a demon in his life, all of his life. He, he would drink and carouse. That's why his manager, Casey Stingle, some have heard of famous Casey Stingle, was always disappointed with Mickey Mantle. Uh, uh, he was very disappointed because he said he is never living up to his potential. If he'd only stop drinking and stop going to the nightclubs and staying up till two o'clock in the morning, imagine how good of a player he could have been. And that was his manager. See, his manager, no matter all the uh, great accolades he got and so forth, but his manager always said, see, uh, he really missed out because he did not discipline uh, himself. But anyway... Um, Bobby Richardson witnessed to him and different people witnessed to him. And about uh, a year before he died, and by the way, he did die of uh, liver cancer, and that was directly related to the matter of drinking. And then he got a liver transplant. And then the other thing was they found that the cancer spread throughout his body. And then uh, there, it was a very uh, aggressive cancer, and he uh, just had a, a very short time to live. So that's when, you see, when he'd have his trouble and he'd have his problems, he would call Bobby Richardson and say, pray for me. Does that sound familiar? See, even people that don't like you, uh, maybe don't respect you, but they get in trouble and they say, oh, would you please pray for me? I need you to pray for me. And so um, the, the family asked him to come and uh, visit him in the hospital just before he died. And uh, 
uh, Bobby Richardson went into the hospital bed and he grabbed his hand and he hugged him and he said, uh, Mickey, he said, I want you to go to heaven with me someday and I want you to be saved. And that's when uh, Mickey Mantle said, just, he said, uh, just recently, Bobby, he said, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and I know I'm saved, and I know I'm on my way to heaven. And Bobby Richardson said, how do you know you're on your way to heaven? And Mickey Mantle said, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. By in a track rack, we have the Mickey, uh, Mickey Mantle, his final inning, and then uh, who said this? Now, see, before Mickey Mantle died, he was interviewed in national television and so forth. And here's what he said. He said, God gave me everything. And he said, I blew it. He said, I threw it all away. God gave me health and strength. And they said in that body, some have uh, analyzed his body. And uh, that's why he could hit all those home runs and why he was could run so fast. He not only was a home run hitter, but he could run as fast as almost anybody. And But, uh, but anyway, uh, somebody actually analyzed his body and uh, who wrote his uh, biography. And they said that inch for inch, he probably had more muscles and more muscle coordination than almost anybody. And that's why he could hit those tape measure uh, home runs. See? And, uh, but he said, God gave me everything and I blew it. And basically he blew it through drinking alcohol. How many great athletes in the athletics world have blown it because they're drinkers? They drink alcohol. Say, I remember uh, years ago when I was playing ball, my mentor said to me, he said, Jim, he said, never drink alcohol. He said, never drink. He said, if you drink alcohol, you'll never amount to anything. And uh, you'll, you'll never be a good ball player. Because, see, we all knew another fellow, and that's another story for another time, who played for the New York Yankees, he owned a bar room, the Sportsman Inn, in South Amboy, New Jersey, and uh, that's why they traded him, because he was getting all the Yankees to come down there and booze it up in the Sportsman Inn on Broadway in South Amboy, New Jersey. But um, you see, that was his demon. He said, I blew it, and he said, for the kids out there. And see, he was looked upon as an icon, as an idol. He said, for the kids out there, uh, don't be like me. Don't make the mistakes that I have made in life. And then he went on and said, and all this is out there in the track rack if you want to get it after the service. He says, I'm no role model. I'm not a role model because I've lived a very wicked, ungodly life. But he got saved. And um, before he died, he came to know Christ as his Savior and he said he had the assurance of salvation. He knew he was saved. And then uh, he asked Bobby Richardson, he said, Bobby, would you please, uh, please preach my funeral? And uh, now Bobby Richardson is not a pastor. He's a ball player. After that, he went on and coached the University of South Carolina uh, baseball team and uh, other places. But so he was a, a ball player. He wasn't a preacher. And so Bobby Richardson preached the funeral of Mickey Mantle. It's, I'm sure it's on YouTube. You can find it. And George Steinbrenner was there, the owner of the New York Yankees at that time. Uh, all the reporters were there. About 2,000 people were there. And it was back actually in a church auditorium. And uh, so Bobby Richardson preached the sermon. Now, and the sermon that Bobby Richardson preached was that a very simple sermon that everybody in the auditorium, whether you're the owner of the Yankees, a player on the Yankees, and all these reporters from around the world, everybody has either said yes to Jesus Christ or 
no to Jesus Christ. Everybody here in this auditorium, you've either said yes to Christ or no to Jesus Christ. Now, he went on to say that if you say, well, maybe I've done it, that means you haven't done it. Say, if I think I've done it, or I'm not sure whether I've done it, that means you haven't done it. See, everybody is on one side or the other in relation to uh, the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Now, and then he went on to say that, you see, you never know when it's going to be your last inning. Say, so you never know when you are going to die. Now, uh, we have these ball players back there in a row. And, uh, you remember what was a year or two ago? Two young people were killed about a mile from the church down on English Town Road. There's still a monument down there. People come and still put, uh, flowers. The 18, 19 year old girl. And then the other one in the other car, they, also got killed. That's just a mile from the church here, down here on, uh, and by the way, there were drugs and alcohol involved in the collision. See, drugs and alcohol, just down the street here. Now, see, so no one ever knows when they're going to die. See, you could be young, you should, could be old. And that's what Bobby Richardson mentioned. See, he said, you never know when you're going to die. And that's why you need to be saved today. You never know when it's going to be your last inning. You never know when you're going to die. So that's an amazing story about Mickey Mantle, how he got saved, how somebody led him to the Lord, and then uh, he knew he was saved, and how uh, he asked Bobby to preach his funeral, and at that funeral, uh, the gospel was preached very, very clearly. And uh, now what are we talking about? The most... Uh, the verse in the Bible that summarizes the Bible more than any other verse, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, someone might, uh, and the question we want to ask, are you saved? Not do you have religion. Not do you, uh, are you trying to um, live a good life? Say, not are you a Baptist or Catholic or Muslim or, or Jew or anything like that. But say, the question is, are you saved? Say, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came into the world to save you. Say, he wants to save you. That's his purpose in coming into the world is to save uh, sinners. Now, some might say, well, pastor, again, as we mentioned, I hope I'm saved. Well, that means you're not saved. Because if you're saved, you know you're saved. Say, you you know it. Say, you have everlasting life. Your sins are forgiven because what Jesus did on the cross. Now, so say, well, uh, maybe I'm saved. See, that means you're not saved. And if that's your thought, you know in your heart, you don't know what the gospel is all about. You've never been saved and you know that. You say, well, maybe uh, and so what you're really saying is you know you've never truly been saved, that you really don't know uh, the Lord as your Savior. And then, then a lot of people say, well, uh, I hope I'm saved. You say, I, I hope, see, and that means you're not saved. See, Bible salvation is a no-so salvation where we know that our sins are forgiven. See, we know that we have been forgiven of our uh, sins. So now, now you see, that's the most important thing. Are you saved? S-A-V-E-D. Are you saved from hell? You say, Pastor, I don't think I'm on my way to hell. No, the Bible says that every person outside of Jesus Christ, whether people like it or not, are on their way to the wrath of God, eternal separation from God, and eternal hell. That's where all unsaved people are headed. So, um, you see, that's why the Bible is very clear that you need to be saved. More than any other thing in life, the most important thing is to be 
saved. See, to know that you're saved. And uh, you might say, well, uh, Pastor, I believe God has been dealing with me lately uh, and speaking to my heart. And, and a lot of times when I go to bed at night, I wonder, am I really saved? I'm not sure I'm really saved. And I know, and you know, if you're like that this morning, say that's the Holy Spirit dealing with you. Say that's the Holy Spirit trying to draw you to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, say the wonderful thing is, is that if someone is not saved, they can be saved very simply. And that is by receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Say, right where you are sitting, you can be uh, saved. So, if somebody wants to be saved, say, uh, they can be saved right now. And they can be saved very, very simply. You see, by coming to Jesus Christ. By realizing that we are sinners and receiving Christ as Savior. Now, the verse says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, put your name in there. What's your name? What's your first name? What's your last name? Put your name in there. See, he came to save sinners. And that's why he wants to save you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. Someone might say, well, I've done some things that I'm, a, I'm ashamed of. I have skeletons in the closet and I don't want anybody to know about that. See, God knows all about our sin and he loves us. He died for us on the, Cal- on the cross of Calvary and he wants to save us from our sin. And you can be saved if you're not saved. See, now that's the Bible word. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, and that's you. That's me. See, we are all sinners and we all need Bible salvation. Now, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, and this has helped a lot of people to come to know the Lord as their Savior. See, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, in other words, in the Bible, the Bible is very, very clear that salvation is a gift. In other words, say, I cannot earn it. I do not deserve it. But it is a gift that God wants to give to me. And it's the most wonderful, important gift in all the world. Say that, that he wants to give me the gift of eternal life. Now, um, we all know the simple uh, teaching of the Bible is that salvation is a gift. We can't earn it, uh, anything like that. We, uh, we simply receive it as a sinner in need of salvation. And we turn from our way our sin, my way to Jesus Christ. See, and uh, I must receive that gift. Now, we all know that when somebody is offered a gift, you see, the gift is of no value unless it's received. Amen? And see, that's uh, why a lot of people are lost on their way to hell They have religion, but they do not have salvation. They may know about the gift. They may know that Jesus Christ died on the cross. But you see, they have never personally received that gift. And that's why, um, you see, we'll look at it Wednesday night. See, one of the most misunderstood verses in all the Bible is Acts 16.31. Say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's one of the most misinterpreted, misquoted verses in the Bible because someone says, well, just believe in Jesus and you're saved. Now, wait a minute. See, when you study the context there, that man was on the verge of committing suicide. See, 
he, uh, because when the prisoners would go free, then the person in charge would be executed. So now number one, see the man, as you read the Bible, it's very, very uh, clear. He was ready to commit suicide. Now he was on the verge of committing suicide and he realized that you see, if he died and committed suicide, he would have went to hell. And he knew that. You see, and that's why the Bible says he came running and he came kneeling down. See, and he's running, he's kneeling down. Why? See, he knew he was a sinner. He knew he needed to be saved. He knew he needed to turn from his sin. And then he said, the only time that question is used, uh, uh, ask in the Bible, what must I do to be saved? And that's why Paul said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Why? But you see, he knew he was a sinner. He knew he needed to be saved. Now, the only person that really can be saved is the person who knows they are a sinner and knows that they need to be saved and they really want to be saved. See, now, It's a gift. You say, well, pastor, in order to get saved, I certainly have to give some money to the church. See, it has nothing to do with money. Uh, Certainly, I need to go through a ceremony or um, I need to confess my sins to a priest. No, see, nothing like that in the Bible. See, it's a gift. And you simply need to receive that gift. Now, Jesus Christ offers you that gift of salvation, but you have the responsibility to accept the gift. Now, have you ever accepted that gift? Do you know that you're saved? Can you say, Pastor, I know there was a time in my life when I accepted the gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. Now, can you say that? Do you really know that? You say, you say, well, Pastor, uh, I'm religious. You say, Pastor, I've always been brought up, uh, uh, I've been brought up in the church. But see, a good Bible word is, have you been converted? Have you been saved? Have you been born again? And you say, well, Pastor, I haven't uh, been converted. I haven't been saved. I haven't been born again. You say, and you'd say, Pastor, uh, I want that gift. It's very simple. Jesus died for you on that cross. He offers you salvation, but you must receive that gift. And if you don't receive it, you don't have salvation. And see, that's a decision. That's a decision that I make to receive the gift of God, which is eternal uh, life. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. And as heads are bowed and as eyes are closed. Now, what we dealt with is uh, verses 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, that is why he came into the world. To save sinners. That's the only group or classification of people that Jesus Christ can save are sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world, this summarizes the whole Bible, to save sinners. And we're all sinners. We all need to be saved. And the only way to be saved is through trusting Christ as our Savior. By simply realizing you're a sinner And you have to make a decision to be saved and ask Him to be your Savior. Now, this is as clear, as obvious as we can make the gospel and the Bible and what salvation the Bible is all about. Faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, Christ Jesus came into the world to save uh, sinners. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever, that means anybody, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And you'd say, um, yes, pastor, I realized this morning that I need to be saved. And I realized that this morning. Now, it helps me to understand what the Bible is all about and so forth. And, and I realized this morning 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I realize that. And uh, Pastor, I really realize I am a sinner. And Pastor, I realize I need to be saved. And Pastor, yes, I want to be saved. And as heads are bowed and as eyes are closed, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me because I want to be saved? I realize I need to be saved. And the best way I know how, I want to invite Christ into my life. This morning, I want this to be my day of decision where I really trust Christ as my Savior and get saved. And if you're like that this morning, say, Pastor, I do want to be saved. Would you pray for me? Would you just raise your hand? And you say, Pastor, that's me. Uh, I know I need to be saved. Maybe you've been fooling around and uh, you put the hand down and you, you say, now, Pastor, this is the thing I'm really searching for. And uh, I, I realize now this is it. I realize I this is what I need. I need Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I do want to get it settled this morning. Maybe there's somebody here this morning, you say, well, you know, Pastor, I don't know if I ever really got it settled. I don't know if I'm really saved or not. Now, I'd like to think I'm saved. Um, I've gone to church. Maybe you made a profession of faith. You were baptized, but you'd say, Pastor, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I don't think I really a hundred percent got it settled. I realize this morning that I am not saved. I need to get it settled and I want to be saved. Would you uh, pray for me? And you'd lift your hand. What we're talking about this morning is some pretty heavy stuff. It is the most important thing in all the world. There's nothing more important than where am I going to go when I die? Amen. Say, there's nothing more important. Have my sins been forgiven? Has my life been changed? Now, maybe there's somebody else and you say, Pastor, I'm just not sure. That's why. And you'd say, Pastor, that's why I'm here this morning because I'm searching. And I realize that that search will end when I really get it, uh, my life straight with Jesus Christ. And someone else would raise your hand. And you say, Pastor, that's me. Uh, that's me. I need to get it settled. Once and for all and forever. Anyone else, you'd say, Pastor, I need to be saved. And uh, the best way I know how, I do realize I'm a sinner. And Pastor, I want to be saved. I may not, may not know everything there is to know about it, but I certainly know I'm a sinner. I want to go to heaven someday. I want, uh, I want to know my sins are forgiven. And I want to be saved this morning. Someone else, and you'd raise your hand. You'd say, Pastor, that's me. I want to get it settled. Say, I, I just don't want to uh, go around wondering, am I really saved? Do I really know the Lord? You get it settled this morning. And I tr- hope you will. And I trust that God will uh, speak to your heart. Anyway.